This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Episode three five four for March twenty fourth, twenty nineteen. Welcome. This March marks the fifth year of Artemis Rising, the annual showcase of women and non-binary authors across the Escape Artists podcasts. I'm your guest host, Mary Fan, author of several young adult and sci-fi fantasy books, including Starswept. A young adult sci-fi romance about a viola-playing girl whose world is upended when she encounters a telepathic boy from across the stars. I'm also the co-editor of Brave New Girls, a young adult sci-fi anthology about girls in STEM, with proceeds going to the Society of Women Engineers Scholarship Fund. My next release will be Stronger Than a Bronze Dragon, a steampunk fantasy about a warrior girl who teams up with a mischievous thief to defeat the Demon King in a world inspired by my parents' home country, China. To learn more about me, check out my website maryfan.com. Our Artemis Rising story today is Word Slinger, Word Reeker by Amanda Helms, a Cast of Wonders original. Amanda Helms is a science fiction and fantasy writer whose fiction has appeared in or is forthcoming from The Cackle of Cthulhu Anthology, Daily Science Fiction, Future Science Fiction Digest, and elsewhere. Amanda blogs infrequently at amandahelms.com and tweets with a smidgen more frequency at at Amanda Helms. She and her husband live in Colorado with their increasingly lazy boxer mix. Today's story is narrated by Stephanie Morris. Stephanie Malia Morris works in a bookstore by day and a library by night, which gives her access to more books than she can possibly read over several lifetimes. She is a recipient of the Octavia E. Butler Memorial Scholarship Award and a graduate of the 2017 Clarion West Writers Workshop. Her short fiction has appeared in, or is forthcoming in, Faya, Apex, and Nightmare. She has narrated short fiction for Starship Sofa, Farfetched Fables, Uncanny, and all four of the Escape Artists podcasts. And now, we've a tale to tell. Word Slinger Word Reeker by Amanda Helms. Narrated by Stephanie Malia Morris. The word slinker first came into last hope on the back of a scarab the size of a large pony during the worst flaying wind storm in a generation. Mind, we didn't know then that she was a word slinker, or even that she was a she. I didn't witness it direct. But later, one of our regulars told me of her, all bundled up in hat and gloves and too big cloak, on account of them winds, you see. She climbed off her scarab with the stiffness of someone too long in the saddle, but like any rider worth her salt, she saw to her mount before she came into the saloon, which is where I first saw her myself. Me and Ruby were on a break, letting my babe Arley grab at and occasionally suck on the tassels of our gowns. Spurs jangling, the word slinker ambled to the bar as she pulled back her cloak. She had two canteens slung on her belt, one on each side, then, slowly, removed her hat, and, slower yet, peeled off her gloves, waiting to see if anyone would comment on her color, I reckon, for the raggedy leather of her attire was just a few shades lighter than her own skin. Sit on down, mister. I am telling you just what the hell the likes of her is doing here. In last hope, we ain't the kind of folks who care about people's skin. So when the word slinger perched on a stool, all William, that's our bartender, said was, Ain't you a little young to be on your own? No. Could I get a whiskey? William laughed. Maybe you ain't too young to be on your own, but you're surely too young for whiskey. He was right. She couldn't have been more than sixteen. Her eyes and too thin face were the sorts aged by experience, not time. I'll fill your canteens for you, though, William said. I don't like to hand them over to strangers. We ain't gonna sabotage your slinging, if that's what you think. They ain't got nothing to do with slinging, she said. They were a gift from my ma, but I'll buy some soup, if you got it. It was hot for soup, 
But a kid word slinger, a girl kid word slinger at that, and further one who's black, it wasn't hard to guess she was counting her coins. Madame Fleur swept down the stairs. On the house, she said. You've seen Madame, so you know what she's like. How she could draw the eye even if she wore a burlap dress. But far from burlap, the word slinger saw Madame like you saw Madame. Dressed in her purple satin gown with black brocade along the front, her hair all tied up in a nice neat bun with just two tendrils allowed to trail down the sides, and her ears adorned with her pride, her pearl bobs. Naturally, it took less time for the word slinger to absorb the vision of Madame than it's taking me to describe, and as William was long used to the vision, he just said, Yes, ma'am, and went to fetch the soup. You've already guessed my profession, what with your rude demand. And the words linger ain't dumb. She'd figured it out, too, as well as Madame's place. She kept her gaze downturned as Madame approached, but we all marked the way her foot tap, tap, tapped against the leg of her stool. I'm Madame Fleur. What's brought you here all alone, if you don't mind my asking? She said kindly, because that's her way. The word slinger glanced quick at me and Ruby, lingering on my Arley, whose skin similar to hers, and then looked back to Madame. All apologetic-like, she said, No offense, ma'am, but I don't intend to be one of your pretty girls. Madame Fleur chuffed. It's clear you already got work of a different sort. William came back with the soup and slid it and a spoon to the word slinger. She tucked in with the eagerness of a half-starved coyote. You don't come to last hope and stay without knowing the way hunger can gnaw at your belly so sharp you think it'll eat your own bones, so we let her take care of her priorities. When she finished, she said, I'm looking for a man what calls himself the drifter. Tall, wheat-colored hair, wears a bolo with rattler fangs. I heard he done come this way. Seen him? Madame said, sharp-like, seen the front and the back of him. Now, I'm not so prideful I won't tell you mention of the drifter set my stomach a-churning. I stood, still holding my ardly. Gonna feed him some mash, I said, and bustled to the kitchen. In passing, I looked to William's shotgun behind the bar for assurance. Cause there's legends round here about the drifter. Story goes, he was a miner that used word slinking to pull gold out of them rocks. He got lost in a mine so deep folks thought even his slinging couldn't save him. Relief flowed all around, cause he was the sort that thought wanting a thing made it his. Months later, the drifter emerged from that mine, and whether from his hateful greed or something old and dark in the mine itself, he came out different. Neither bullet nor blade hurt him. However it happened, I believe it's true, cause on Madame's instructions, William and Leonard what runs the general store, ran him off. But later, William, white-faced, said he shot the man's shoulder, but he neither faltered nor bled. I reckon the drifter didn't fancy himself run off so much as amused to leave. After setting Arley in a basket so he wouldn't roll into something he shouldn't, I poured some milk in a bowl and put a bit of bread in to soak. Sound carries from the bar, and despite my better intentions, I moved quiet, so I heard tapping, one, two, three, one, two, three. The word slinger, keeping a rhythm, may be practicing slinging in her head. I'll be taking a room if you'll think he'll be back. What do you want with the drifter? William asked, afore Madame could say as whether there was room for her or not. There was. Madame always finds space for one's young as her but that don't mean she minds making him sweat a little for wondering. More of that drumming, but faster and with a harder beat at the end. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. He killed my sister. My ma died of grief soon after. I will take my retribution. Like a devil got hold of me, I set to mashing the now-soaked bread with more force than necessary. William snorted. Ain't retribution taken a job for your pa? Ain't got no pa, and he wasn't my sister's pa anyway. You got a room for me or not? That, combined with her skin, which wasn't so black as some, explained the word slinger's apologetic nature. Like her ma had been a pretty girl herself, and the man who sired her, cause she's right she ain't got no pa, 
a white man who'd have had no interest in providing for a mixed child. My Arlie's mixed, too, and the sudden reminder of the drifter plus the wordslinger story had my hands trembling as I picked up the bowl and dropped it on the stone hearth. It shattered. A shard bounced up and cut my cheek. Madame, William, Ruby, and the wordslinger burst in right as I was pressing a kerchief to the cut. It soaked through right quick. Dropped Arlie's mash, I said. Ruby brought me a chair and set to cleaning up while William went to fetch some bandages. Madame inspected my cheek. Arlie still lay in his basket, a-sucking his fingers. The wordslinger said, The noise. He ain't crying. He can't hear, I said, ever since he was born. The words linger stared at him, maybe marking the similarity of their skin. She turned to me. I can help. She ducked her head, like she wished for her hat again to cover her eyes. If you want. I can live with a scar, but I suppose I'd rather not. They're somewhat like their pretty girls with scars, but most often blemishes are bad for business. The word slinger pulled the kerchief from my cheek and whispered, Blood, congeal. Skin, you heal. Blood, you quit a flowin. Skin, you knit, bit by bit. Leave no need for sewin. Simple rhyme, I'll grant you, but the word slinger kept repeating it, and when William returned and wiped my cheek with a bandage, he let out a low whistle. Ain't no mark, Bertha. Your skin's smooth as Arley's. Well, Madame cleared her throat. I don't let rooms to people whose names I don't know. Lifting her head with the grace of a queen, the word slinger said, I go by Nightingale. Well, looks like you're getting a bit antsy, mister. Wondering what all this has to do with your question. It has everything to do with your question. So how about I have William give you a round on the house while I continue explaining. As I said, Madame did have a room for Nightingale, and she took it. Weeks passed, long enough for us to get to know her, and to hope that maybe the drifter had moved on elsewhere. Days, Nightingale pitch in with fixing fence posts and the like. You've been here long enough, I reckon, to know there's not much to last hope beyond this here saloon, Leonard's general store, and the watering trough. Enough, though, for them that work the mine five miles yonder. So if there was no odd job that needed doing, Nightingale'd spend hours pacing up and down the street or tending her scarab. Truth to tell, I think she was envisioning how it'd go down when the drifter returned and she faced him. Nights she'd spend in the saloon, often offering to watch Arley while I was otherwise occupied. On my breaks, I'd see her dandling him on her knees, foot a tapping while she made patterns with her free hand. One evening, when I found time enough for a sit, I joined her and nudged her shoulder. She said ardly in his basket. What? She coughed. <clears throat> I mean, you need something, Bertha? Considering the life she's had, I didn't blame her for her poor manners. She was trying. I indicated her hands. You keep making patterns. What are they? She brought her hands out of her lap and stared at them. I hadn't seen them up close before. They had raised whitish lines, burn scars. From the placement of them, I reckon they weren't no cooking fire accident, but I ain't never asked. Word slinging. She must have seen something in my expression, because right quick she said, It ain't nothing bad. My ma was mute taught me and my sister her signs, and I'm slinging some of that to Arley. I perked up. Your ma was deaf? No, just mute. A John of hers. She darted a glance at me and swallowed. Well, she had to find a way to communicate. After. I trusted Nightingale, mind, but her slinging near my Arley made me nervous. Would you mind telling me what the slinging is? Nightingale frowned like her first instinct was to say no, but she cleared her throat. So quiet, I had to lean in to hear her, she said. Word slinger, word singer, word sayer, word slayer, 
All these and more you are. Word maker, word breaker, word reeker, word keeper. You'll go far, my child, so far. The power of it tugged at me, firm as if she'd tied a string direct to my heart. It was a small thing, to be sure, but it held power, nonetheless. My ma used to sling it to me, she said, quiet, like she was talking to her own hands and not me at all. First with her tongue, while she still had it. Then when she didn't, I had them memorized. She'd sign while I slung, and that was how she taught me in grace. A frown, and all low-like. I ain't gone so far, though. There was much I could have said in return to that, but I chose. Your ma was a wordslinger herself, then? Never claimed it, but I got it from somewhere. I knew better than to suggest the man who'd sighed her might have been one. There's a strength involved in being what we are and surviving it. Because as you'll recall, Nightingale's ma died of grief. And grief ain't no weakness, it's human. So I wasn't about to say anything that might indicate Nightingale's own strength come from a man who ain't worth his spit. Words of that sort make me further disinclined to like you, mister. The price of your free drink is my story, so stop with your eye-rolling and sigh-heaving. You ain't a bellows. You'll allow me one more indulgence before I come round to the drifter's return. You may be wondering why Nightingale stayed in last hope for weeks on end instead of heading out to seek her enemy. I reckon it's because she believed, like most, it wouldn't be much longer till he came back. Also, I think she stayed because a life on the road is a hard one, and even a small, got-nothing-far-north-flang-wind town like Last Hope is better than being out on your own with naught but the clothes on your back, a rucksack, and your riding scarab. A lot of myths about word slingers done rise up like chokeweed, that they're lone figures on the horizon, always looking for the next word fight, ever roaming and with no connections, no family. Like being without such ties makes them stronger. I don't think it makes them stronger. It just makes them lonely. But somewhere down the line, I reckon Nightingale bought into those stories. At least a little. So even if she wouldn't have admitted to it, I reckon the main reason she stayed is because she hungered for family. And even a got-nothing far north flang wind town like Last Hope can provide that. Better than some others. "'cause we know how to hold on to each other in the midst of hardship. "'Yes, this is all important, so shut up and listen.'" The drifter returned on a blustery, but not a flaying wind, day. Leonard was the first to hear of it. Some of his ranch hands came flying in on their locust to warn him the drifter was coming, on foot, but relentless as a tornado. When the drifter had allowed himself to be run off, he'd set fire to Leonard's crops for spite, and Leonard lost near fifty acres. So Leonard wasn't happy to hear of it, but he also ain't no gunman, and truth to tell, don't much like associating with gunmen. So he burst into the saloon a-huffing and puffing and through wheezes, got the word out. Nightingale perched at her accustomed place on a bar stool, and at Leonard's word she went stiller than a titmouse spotted by a hawk. Which direction, she said, bereft of her normal rhythm and lilt. Leonard looked at her askance and said, North, which was toward his ranch and why he was all over worried. Cause he still had some fields that could burn yet, and the drifter ain't the sort to leave a thing undone. Without another word, Nightingale slid off her stool and was out the saloon. Madame ran after her so fast she had to hike up her skirts, which she'd have normally never done, but the loss of the rhythm that made you think Nightingale slinging was always around the corner. It had all of us worried. William with his shotgun, Ruby, me, Arlie in my arms, and what other pretty girls were free went out after her. I don't know if you've ever been to a word fight, but for all that last hopes on the corner of nowhere and the edge of nothing— We've had our share of word slingers come through to challenge the miners for their gold. 
Word-slinking's got power on its own, you know. But when there's witnesses, well, those are fights slingers live and die by. I don't mind telling you my heart was in my throat when I came out on the street and saw Nightingale astride her scarab, kerchief pulled up round her face, and hat slung low over her eyes, gloves back on her hands, and her ma's canteens gleaming bright enough to blind. It struck me all at once that kit was her armor, girding her loins for battle and all. She waited in the middle of the road, facing north, as she drew a long swig from one of her canteens, swished, then spat. Though her face was mostly hidden, I could have sworn her eyes squinted and glinted as a plume of smoke from Leonard's fields bore up on the horizon. Leonard had long gone, and some of what men and women could leave their duties done it, on account of wanting to help him save what was left of his fields best they could. But all of us what worked at the saloon, we stood by Nightingale. Against the backdrop of smoke, the drifter ambled down the street, He brought with him a sour smell, like old milk and old blood. It blew on the wind before him. His pale hair was uncovered, and as he neared I heard over the wind a steadier hum, one that set my toes to curling and my mouth to twisting. I imagined it was, to me, to all of us, like those high-pitched sounds only dogs can hear, that make them pin their ears tight to their heads. Nightingale started up her own hum, a counterpoint, And while I can't say for sure it weren't no coincidence, the smoke from Leonard's farm stopped pluming. If the drifter noticed, he gave no indication. He stopped thirty paces from us where we thronged alongside Nightingale, who remained in the middle of the street on her scarab. But when the drifter turned his attention to the crowd, and then to her, she dismounted, and she stayed steady as he continued down the street, each of his footsteps sending up a small cloud of dust. My, my, he said, in a voice meant to carry. Quite a gathering. What's this welcoming committee that's come all for little old me? Nightingale pulled down her kerchief. Shoulders straight and the line of her back wooden, she said. Ain't you heard? I'm the nightingale, and my words, they're gonna make you writhe and wail, cause I got style, and I got class, and I'm gonna drop you on your ass. The second the last word left her mouth, it was like a giant invisible fist knocked the drifter straight back on his buttocks, sending up a cloud of dust that covered him like pollen. But he wasn't down long, and he came up laughing. Hoo-wee! Quite a wallop you back there, little miss. Between one blink and the next, the drifter was but ten paces away. And he said, Ha, huh, Nightingale, say why is that? Cause you think you sing so sweet? Think these folk are in for a treat? Now some of Nightingale's tap, tap, tapping of her foot and the signing of her hands in her weeks with us I reckon must have been her planning her opening slinging as well as other rhymes. But word-slingers, good word-slingers, have to be quick on their feet and quick with their rhymes. Though the drifter's words made her stagger some, she wasn't near going down, and she said, Not no treat but a trident, cause my rhymes, they're vibrant. Best not think you can fight it, cause mister, this here trident, it'll spear you all the way through and through. At that, something done stabbed the drifter, for he doubled over and force of that something dragged him back three feet. But he dug his boots in the dust, and he stopped. And when he lifted his head again, it was clear he knew he dealt with the wordslinger, real and true. Quicker than the flick of a whip, he slung, You don't know me, you don't know mine, you don't know nothing about my kind, but still you're here to challenge me when the wiser thing to do is flee. The force of it knocked Nightingale off her feet and into a hitching post ten feet yonder. Madame let out a little cry and started for her, but William, grim-faced, caught her and shook his head. Word slingers are on their own, you see. The spectators' reactions, their initial gasps, gut twists, cheers and cries, can give power to the slinging, but physical interference? That of doomed Nightingale. Slinging relies on the words. My mouth thinned as Nightingale pulled herself back to her feet. She moved careful, 
like she had a bruised rib at best and a cracked one at worst. She hacked and spat bloody phlegm, but she still slung. Birds got wings, bees got buzz, bats got teeth, and bears got claws. Now I've got all these things, but you've got not that does. Clutching Arley to my breast, I exchange glances with Madame, then William, all of us withholding groans. It wasn't a strong sling. For one thing, bees have wings like birds, and bats have teeth like bears. Worse, her meter hitched. Nonetheless, maybe it gave Nightingale some of the teeth and claws she slung about, for she stood a little taller and seemed to breathe a little easier. It done nothing to the drifter, though. A smile suited to the devil himself spread over his face. What is that racket? Think you can hack it? Think if you whack it, then I won't track it? But I gotta say, skill, girl, you lack it. Nightingale gasped and dropped to her knees. She cradled her ribs as blood dripped from her mouth and onto the dirt of the street. Skittering to her, her scarab chittered and flashed its wings. She hung onto it and drug herself upright, but it was clear she'd fall again without its support. The drifter advanced. He wasn't no more than three steps from her when he said, not slinging, he was that confident. Why, you're hardly more than a child. Why is it you think you got to fight me? Nightingale hacked and spat. The spittle landed on her boot. To the drifter's amused smirk, she slung, all in a croak. My sister was called Grace. Her movement matched her name. You took her and left no trace, so your life I've come to claim. As before, the words bolstered Nightingale. She leaned less on her scarab. But as before, her slinking had no effect on the drifter. Grace? I don't remember no grace. He yanked her hat off her, then turned her head this way and that with a rough hand. I clutched Arley too tightly, and William cocked the shotgun, for all the good it'd do to a man who don't bleed. The drifter was back to smiling. Oh, yes, I do remember now. Colored girl, her tears tasted sweet like honey. He smacked his lips. You, though, I bet you taste bitter, like dandelions. With that, the drifter stuck out his long red tongue and licked up her neck to her chin and across her cheek. Madame had to hold William back then. But the drifter wasn't done yet. He grinned at the tears streaking Nightingale's face, stood back, and slung, the cut of your jib ain't for violence. I think you'd do better in silence. Nightingale scrabbled at her throat. Her eyes bugged out, and she made tiny whimpering noises that about broke my heart and Madame's and William's from the looks on all their faces. The drifter put his hands on his hips and stared down at her. She'd sunk into the dirt. Well, what I ought to do with you now? He nudged her with a boot. Been thinking to take on an apprentice, but I never thought it'd be no colored girl. He focused on Madame, a rattler ready to strike, but I got some other business to attend to first, it seems. He started for us. William's quicker than a startled jackrabbit when he wants to be, and he hoisted up the shotgun, aimed and fired faster than it takes you to blink twice. The drifter looked down at his belly, where a ragged hole now graced his shirt, but no blood came. Now, we've been through this already, he said. You can't hurt me. He started forward again, but Nightingale up and grabbed his foot. Her other hand wriggled in the dirt. I squinted, trying to get a better view. And I smiled. For Nightingale's hand, it wasn't wriggling, but signing. The drifter, frowning, shook off her hand. Near stomped on it, but she yanked back too quick, and that hand started signing like the first. What do you think you're doing, fool? He kicked her in the middle, hard, and William cocked the gun again. Nightingale curled in on herself, panting, but her fingers kept on signing, kept on slinging. The drifter had already discounted her, 
So his back was to her when she hoisted herself upright, blood a-running down her nose, and screamed. So harsh and shrill, I think if she'd been but a foot closer to the saloon, she'd have shattered the glass of its windows. That gave the drifter pause. Nightingale still sign-slung. At the same time, in a voice more suited to a frog, she voice-slung. Do your worse with your verse. Do your time with your rhyme. Cause you think you intimidate. But I know you're just low rate. A reprobate, full of hate. And I'll lead you to your fate. By the time she neared the end of it, the drifter's face had gone all purple, and he was shouting his own sling over her, trying to drown her out. I couldn't quite catch all of it, "'cause Nightingale's voice were getting stronger the longer she went on, "'the more she kept signing. "'But he said something like, "'Oh, this little lady thinks she's more than a baby. "'Oh, this little sprite, she ain't got no fight.' "'Whether it was the power of Nightingale slinking with voice and hands combined, "'or the strength of vengeance desired, "'or the strength passed down from her ma, "'or even sheer cussedness, "'the drifter had little effect on our Nightingale.' She outslung him, pure and simple. She stood straight and tall by this point, and though he had more than a foot on her, she nonetheless seemed taller than him, tall as a giantess, and her voice took on a liquid quality, like the honey he'd mentioned to rile her. I didn't know it then, but Nightingale told me later that her signing matched her spoken words when she said, in a voice of quiet surety. My mama taught me never to fear. My mama taught me never to veer. My mama taught me heart be true. My mama taught me to defeat you. Though there was nothing direct in it to drive him to his knees, he done fail nonetheless. Without a second's hesitation, she caught up his collar and leaned close to his ear. This is how you die, you son of a bitch, without a cry, without a twitch. And I swear upon my own mama's grave, his mouth made o's like a surprised fish, and he keeled over. Just like Nightingale slinging commanded, he made no cry, and he made no twitch. We burned the drifter's body, of course, because like I said, maybe he was a man once, but no longer. Fire is safest, with his like. As we watched the ash that had been the drifter rise on the breeze, I said to Nightingale, What are you planning now? Heading back home? She laughed a little, though it sounded more like a choked cough. <laughs> I never right thought on it, she didn't say, because I didn't think I'd live, but it was in her eyes. Boneford ain't home no more, not with Talia and Ma gone. She peered down the street and out toward the desert wilds, and I reckon she was thinking on more long, bitter cold nights with meals of dried root and only her scarab for company. You could stay on here, Madame said. All respect, Madame Fleur, but I still don't intend to be a pretty girl. Once again, I wasn't about to ask, she said. But William could always use some help round the bar. Arlie's fist found a curl. I worked to disentangle it. And I'd sure appreciate if you could teach me your signs. I don't mind saying. My voice hitched. I, I want to talk with my boy. Stay. Madame set her hand on Nightingale's shoulder, squeezed. There's a place for you here, Nightingale. She bowed her head near soft as a butterfly's flap, said, Much obliged. I see you finished your whiskey, mister. Must have been some time ago, though you never asked for another. Well, you'll get no more on the house. Cause all those details you thought didn't matter to my story? They do. They show we're a family in this here saloon, in this here town, and like I said, Last Hope ain't one of them towns that abides by the sort of talk you spouted about our nightingale. Which is why William's getting the shotgun, same as the one as didn't fell the drifter. I'm betting, though, 
it'd fail you. Before you run off, though, let me finish the tale proper. That, mister, is how Last Hope came by its first word slinker. But it's just a piece of how she became a part of its family. Wordslinger, Wordreaker, draws upon the old American West genre, but gives it a creative twist. Instead of guns, outlaws duel it out in a showdown of words. The story draws upon the familiar tropes of classic Westerns, the saloon, the mysterious stranger, the revenge tale, and creates a vivid atmosphere. You can practically smell the whiskey and dirt, hear the clinking of spurs. Yet, it's also undeniably original, with its use of wits as weapons, and seems very self-aware of the genre it's in. Those tropes are present, yes, but they exist to be toyed with. Of course, one of the most frustrating things about old-school westerns is that everyone is white, even though historically speaking, this was not even a little bit true. Wordslinger, Wordreaker, features a young woman of color in its sexual role, and as a non-white fan of westerns, I was thrilled to finally see a tale starring someone other than a Clint Eastwood knockoff. Anyway, this is a fantastic story full of fascinating characters, vibrant descriptions, and some very clever wordplay, and I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Join us again next week for our final Artemis Rising story for 2019. Cast of Wonders loves bringing you the best audio fiction week after week, but they can't do it without your support. Your donations pay their authors, narrators, servers, and staff. Please consider supporting them with a monthly donation through either PayPal or Patreon. You can also review them on iTunes, request on Spotify, and consider the stories they publish for award considerations. There are lots of ways you can help. Join the discussion on the EA forum, forum forum.escapeartists.net, or visit on Twitter at Cast of Wonders. Come say hello! Cast of Wonders is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is brought to you by editor and host Marguerite Kenner, assistant editors Catherine Inskip, and Alexis Goebel, associate editors Tanya Vespalco, Amy Brennan, Alicia Caparasso, Trace Fontil, William Haig Minor, Andrew Cahoe, Sean Proctor, Ray O, Susie Rodriguez, Carissa Sluss, Emma Smales, and Chris Tang. Audio producer, Jeremy Carter, and community manager, Danny Daly. Our Artemis Rising episodes this year are brought to you by the editorial team of Amy Brennan and Carissa Sluss, supported by Catherine Inskip and Alexis Scoble, and produced by Marguerite Kenner. Cast of Wonders episodes are released under the Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. That means you can download or listen to the episode on any device you like, but you can't change it or sell it. The theme music, Appeal to Heavens, is by Alexi Nov and available from Promo DJ or his Facebook page. I'm guest host Mary Fan, and thanks for listening. <laughs>